Ayn Rand is best known for her novels, Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead, and other works, uh, fiction that she wrote, that defend the system of laissez-faire capitalism. And in her work, she shows that the businessmen are great creators. They're the ones who promote economic growth, prosperity, and civilization. And it's the government and who interferes with them and tries to block them. And there are people, she term second raiders, who don't envy, who don't like the business creators and envy them and try to reduce everything to their own level. And they interfere with the the creations of the uh, great businessmen. Of course, John Galt is the best known of these heroes. And she's also known, which very much associated with this uh, uh, praise for laissez-faire capitalism, she's noted for her uh, philosophy of ethical egoism. Uh, she wrote a, a collection of essays called The Virtue of Selfishness. Now, when uh, in ordinary language, Selfishness is usually a bad word. Most people, if you say someone is selfish, it means something like when all the dis tra tray of desserts is set out or plate of cookies, the person will grab all of them for himself and not leave any for other people. Uh, she didn't mean when she was praising selfishness to be defending selfishness in that sense. It wasn't that she thought people should behave in a boorish way. Uh, however, uh, so she can't, it, it isn't that she has the point of view of a character in one of P.G. Woodhouse's novel who says to the famous butler Jeeves, whenever anything comes up, I always ask myself one question, what's in it for me? It isn't, that isn't her point of view. Uh, but on she's talking about egoism in the sense of each person should uh, regulate his life as to what will advance his own well-being, what will preserve his own life. However, uh, her view of ethics is one very much at variance with many things at least most people believe in ordinary morality. For example, she holds that under laissez-faire capitalism, uh, people who would not be able to uh, live on their own efforts, say disabled people or people who were uh, had mental problems, uh, would receive private charity and there'd be probably, since we'd be much more prosperous, there'd be much more scope for private charity, but she doesn't regard charitable giving, even this voluntary kind, as anything particularly ethically mandated or even praiseworthy. She just thinks people would do it since we tend to sympathize with one another. But her views are here are quite at variance with uh, what at least most people tend to believe. Uh, regardless of whether they what they put in practice. But as I say, uh, she's best known for this philosophy of ethical egoism and her defense of capitalism in her novels. But this these views aren't what she regarded as the most philosophically fundamental. She thought these views, defend, cap, defense of capitalism and ethical egoism, were consequences of more fundamental principles. And what did she have in mind here? Uh, the key underlying principle of her philosophy is best grasped if we look at the name of her philosophy, objectivism. Uh, what did she mean when she called her philosophy objectivism? Uh, by this name, she meant that philosophy is concerned 
with the accurate grasp of existence, with grasping reality. Now, at first, it, this might seem an odd principle to make your foundational principle, not in the sense that we shouldn't try to grasp reality, but on the contrary, it seems odd in the sense that who, aside from a few skeptics, would deny that what we're trying to do in philosophy and in all our intellectual activities is to grasp the truth? Uh, who would, uh, would we find people who say, well, uh, I'm not interested in what reality is or what's true, what I, I just care about my own fantasy. That would seem, on the surface at any rate, to be a strange position. But Rand didn't see matters this way at all. Uh, in her view, uh, there, she sees the entire history of philosophy as a battle between those philosophers who give primacy to existence and those who defend what she calls the primacy of consciousness. Now, in order to see how her view is plausible, how this makes sense, we have to understand what she means by the existence when she speaks of the primacy of existence. And what she meant was by existence was primarily the physical world, the world that's out there. She didn't think that when people are born, we immediately have a concept of a physical world in contrast with the mind, but we do, we did, we do immediately have the notion of something out there, something that's fixed, something that is not uh, subject to alteration just by thinking about it. And she didn't deny that there was such a thing as consciousness. On the contrary, she affirmed it. But she thought that consciousness was not primary. Uh, when, say, I say I'm thinking, I'm thinking of something. I My thought is directed outward toward reality. If I said, I'm thinking, and you ask me, what are you thinking about? It wouldn't make sense to say, well, I'm not thinking of anything. I'm just thinking. So what Rand held is that in thinking, I'm thinking of something. I have an, there's an object to my thought, and the object would be something in the external world, something outside of my thought. Similarly, if I said, I'm seeing something, another mental act, I have to be seeing something that's out there. It wouldn't make sense to say, I'm just seeing, I'm not seeing anything, but I'm just seeing things. Now, you might think, well, what about, can't we see or think about images of, in our mind rather than an external object? But in her view, images or mental content of similar sort would be secondary. They could only come, an image could only come from something in the external world. So the what's there externally in the world is primary. Uh, so she thought then to sum up that the mental is not primary, the mental exists but it's directed outward. And it also, the, men, the mind is not composed of some separate spiritual substance. It isn't like a, a, some people are called dualists, say there's both matter and mind. She didn't think that the mind was some sort of independently existing entity that was composed of a different substance, different uh, type of ontological substance from uh, the rest of reality. She thought there were minds, but they're not composed of some sort of mental substance. So uh, given these views, she rejected idealism, which is the philosophical doctrine 
uh, held by Bishop George Barclay in the 18th century, among others, that only mind exists, Barclay held. There was no such thing as matter. There were just uh, ideas and acts of thought. So she rejected that. And she also rejects the notion of a separately existing realm of universals. Now, to understand what her view is here, we have to uh, get what is a universal. Well, suppose I'm say I'm looking at, a, I can consider various red objects. Say I'm looking at a red pencil or a red wall, a red brick. I can say, what does do all these objects have in common? The property, the, so something like the redness, you can say, uh, uh, like a, uh, in, an adjective, the redness. Now, there's some philosophers who held that aside from these individual entities that have the redness, redness itself exists apart from these entities. We can talk of the red itself, not just red things. And she rejected that view. She said there are no independently existing universals. We find just properties are held or in objects. Now, uh, given this way of looking at things, it's not surprising that she condemned Plato, who was the, uh, the great Greek philosopher, because he held his, one of his primary doctrines, his famous theory of forms, where he accepted this view that universals exist separately from the uh, various entities that have them. And he not only accepted independent universals in the sense of independently existing properties, he thought, although his view varies at various times in his dialogues, that all entities were really copies of some sort of other world that consisted of ideal properties or ideal objects. So there was the, we could say, existing tables, kind of a table I can see in front of me right now, are really just a copy of the ideal or perfect table. And these, in turn, these forms or universals were unified in some kind of system. And there was a supreme uh, form or universal, a form of the good that really was the ultimate principle underlying this set of forms. Uh, so Rand rejected that view, and she held that uh, when Plato advanced it, he was really uh, succumbing to irrationalism. He was rejecting reason because to her, reason is something that must work from from concepts that we obtain through the senses, but Plato claimed that we could have a direct knowledge, not a sensory, sensory knowledge, but a direct knowledge of the world of these universals that we wouldn't grasp through sensory means. So she regards this as a type of irrationalism. And she felt that the Plato had inaugurated a whole a tradition of philosophy that uh, of irrationalism in this kind, and that this was a, uh, had serious effects on the whole subsequent history of philosophy. Uh, the uh, great uh, mathematician philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, in his Process and Reality, 1929, said that the history of philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. So if you accept that account, then Rand's view would have a consequence that a great deal of the history of philosophy is wrong. Now, uh, what I'm trying to do now is just give you an overview of Rand's entire system, and then we're going to concentrate in some of the lecture day a bit more on the metaphysics and epistemology. But I should say what I'm trying to do now is just give you an overview of her of her thought. Uh, now. Uh, 
Uh, Plato's main enemy, and in Rand's view, the uh, source of a good tradition in philosophy, which is opposed to this bad Platonic irrationalist view, was Aristotle. Uh, although uh, there are re residues of Platonism in uh, Aristotle's thought, he rejected the independently existing world of forms. He thought the universals just exist in objects. So uh, Aristotle will say, go back to our earlier example of the red uh, pencil, the red brick, the red wall. He would say, well, there are these objects that ha are red, but there's no such thing as redness that exists apart from these objects. Now, Rand's view of universals, that we'll see later, isn't the same as Aristotle, but she thought this was definitely a step in the right direction. Now, one further very important point about Rand's thought is, as you will have gathered already from uh, my mentioning that she condemned Plato for mysticism, she regarded religion and belief in God very negatively. Her philosophy is very firmly uh, based, or has was one of its key principles, atheism, a rejection of existence of God. And why does she reject God? Well, you can see uh, already why she would be led to this position from what I said about the primacy of existence in the sense taking the physical world as primary or more uh, to consciousness. Now, if God exists, and at least God is taken in the traditional sense, God is the create is a is a spiritual substance who created the world, as we Genesis 1 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So if you accept belief in God in this way, you would be saying that the existence, the world that's given to us in the senses, the physical world, depends on consciousness, namely God's consciousness, and this violates the fundamental principle of her system. Now, uh, despite her atheism, though, she takes a surprisingly favorable view of St. Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval philosopher, the great, usually considered the greatest philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church. It, you, this is, is surprising at first because Aquinas not only believed in God, he thought that he could show, he could prove by reason that God exists. Now, of course, she rejected Aquinas' proofs for existence of God, but she thought that Aquinas had developed the tradition of Aristotle much further. He, in certain of his work, such as his work on on uh, on the emotions and on uh, on various other topics, he had extended Aristotle's thought. And in reviving Aristotle, he broke with the. Platonism of the earlier Middle Ages. Now, there's some authorities on Aquinas who think that he Aquinas was pretty much retained much of Platonism, but she didn't accept that interpretation. And Rand and the uh, philosophers in her uh, her tradition, her, her followers such as Leonard Peikoff, uh, hold the view that. This revived Aristotelianism of Aquinas led to the Italian Renaissance, that the Italian Renaissance was fundamentally Aristotelian. This is a very controversial view. There are historians such as Ernst Cassirer, great German historian of philosophy, who thought the Italian Renaissance was primarily Platonic, but she didn't accept that view. And there are other historians such as Paul Oscar Christeller who hold the same view as she 
did, but Aristotelianism was uh, uh, pro was very important in the Renaissance. Now, uh, sh a another philosopher who came in in the in the uh, in the sixteenth uh, early seventeenth century that she thinks very much is a bad guy was Descartes, René Descartes, the founder of the so-called Cartesian tradition. Cartesian is based on Descartes' name. So what, what, why did she view Descartes as an enemy? You see, in her history of philosophy, it's really a struggle between good guys and bad guys. You know, she was an excellent novelist and she knew how to tell a good story so she can make the history of philosophy seem to be very much into a battle of good and bad people. So she makes it very interesting. Now, Descartes, in his thinking, uh, said he wanted, in famous meditation, said he wanted to try to doubt anything that could possibly be doubted. So after this method of doubt was was applied, what was he left left with? Well, his own thinking. He said he can't doubt that he thinks, and he, if he's thinking, then he exists. So he can't doubt that he exists. Now Rand rejected this starting point, not of course because she doubted that people thought or existed, but she said if this is what her followers called an inside-out philosophy. You're starting with your own consciousness or thinking and then saying, how can I proceed from that to prove the existence of the external world? So from her point of view, this is the wrong way to go. What you're supposed to do is start with the, the world out there and that's primary. Existence exists, remember, is the fundamental slogan. So we don't start with trying to think up what's in our conscious, go from what's in our consciousness to what's really out there. Now, uh, we now come to the main villain in the entire history of philosophy in this in her view, was Immanuel Kant. Now, why did she have such a negative view of Kant? Well, as she interpreted Kant, Kant thought that we don't perceive reality as it is as it is in itself. On the contrary, the mind has a certain set of categories that it uses to construct reality. So, what we're, what we perceive is what Kant called the phenomenal world, the world as it appears to us. In Rand's view, this amounts to saying that the mind makes up reality. So this is worse than Descartes because Descartes, in her view, was just saying, how do we, we're starting with the mind, how do we get from the mind to the real world? Kant was saying, the mind makes up the real world. So this, in her view, is much worse. And she thinks of Kant and his successors, such as uh, Hegel and Nietzsche, is inaugurating modern irrationalism, that they had the view that really the mind is making up the world. And one of the fundamental points in Rand's entire thought is that ideas about metaphysics, uh, uh, study of what the ultimate foundations of existence and epistemology, the theory of knowledge, have co consequences for practical affairs for history. Really, these are the metaphysical and epistemology, the most fundamental determinants of history. So, she, uh, in the work of one of her followers, uh, Leonard Peikoff, who's a literary heir, called Ominous Parallels, uh, 
Peikoff argues that Kant's philosophy led ultimately to the Nazis because the Nazis rejected reason and thought really they could impose their will on reality. They could impose their fantasies of racial domination on reality. And in Rand's view, this ultimately stems from, from a Kantian approach. I should mention just as interesting point might find interesting. Uh, when this book uh, by Peikoff first appeared, uh, I did a very critical review of it, and it's got me into quite a bit of trouble with supporters of Rand. Uh, I'm still, i rather inclined to think better of the book than I did when I wrote the review, although I still have problems with it. But this is a view that the uh, the book, you should read the book if you can, because it shows how important Rand, Rand thinks ideas about metaphysics and epistemology are in their practical significance. Now, again, continuing the, this overview, uh, Rand's philosophy uh, has distinctive doctrines in epistemology as well as in metaphysics. If our aim in philosophy is to grasp the world as it actually exists, the real world out there, uh, according to Rand, the way to do this is that the world that we have to get all our concepts by abstraction from the senses. So According to Rand, the mind begins as a blank slate in the Latin phrase that John Locke used. The mind is a tabula rasa, blank slate. We don't have, in her view, innate ideas or instincts. Uh, she's at variance here with certain some views in modern biology and psychology, but that's her view. We don't have innate ideas or instincts. And when we uh, say the senses look out, uh, perceive things, say, again, we say before we have ideas or concepts, the senses can perceive similarities and differences in things. Say, let's go back to our example. Uh, we're uh, say we're looking at a red pencil, red brick, red wall, and say let's imagine uh, as before we have the color concept, we don't have the idea of red. We can see these various red objects. Probably be uh, very young if we don't have the color concepts yet. But according to Rand, the we the senses can grasp what the similarities and differences of these objects are, and it will, the senses will be able to see what they have in common, namely their color, and then the mind can put aside the differences and get the similarity, namely the red color, and then the mind would get a concept of red. Now, once you've gotten some concepts, you can combine them and get a very elaborate system of concepts and built up and very highly structured. But according to her, all the concepts have to really come from the senses. We start with the sensory concepts. If there's a concept that you have, some idea you have, that can't be traced ultimately to the senses, Rand thinks this is a meaningless concept. So all properly formed concepts have to be abstracted from the senses, not necessarily immediately, but you have to have some kind of, you have to be able to trace them back to sense perception in her view. And now also, if our aim in philosophy is to respond adequately to reality, this has definite consequences for ethics as well. Now, in Rand's view, uh, ethics is really based on biology in this sense, that uh, man is different from other animals. Other animals survive by instinct. They're 
they've been built by evolution in a certain way to respond in various ways to things they are likely to come across. So they they know they instinctively know how to act in various situations. But man, remember, in her view, has no instinct. So human beings have to rely on reason in order to survive. So given this fact that we have to rely on reason in order to survive, she thinks that uh, the what the this gives us the purpose of ethics and the standard of ethics that each person is to use reason to secure his own survival as a reasoning being. So, because in, we have uh, no instincts, we have to use reason in order to survive, and this gives us the purpose of ethics. Now, if a man wants to survive, he has to, how he has to, how can he do that? Well, one thing he has to do in order to survive is to establish a political system based on recognition of individual rights and particularly recognition of property rights. And he also has to establish a system of laissez-faire capitalism because this is the only economic system that will enable human beings to attain prosperity and promote their own survival. So here, her views on economics are very similar to those of Ludwig von Mises, whom she admired. She didn't like Mises' philosophy all that much, but she did think highly of his economics. And just as Mises does, she stresses that it's through social cooperation through the free market is how human beings can attain prosperity. We, we're, we don't have to fight each other. There's no uh, basic conflicts between people, but we can cooperate. There's a harmony of interests among people that's promoted if we have free market. And if we have a free market recognition of individual rights, then uh, in her view, there's only a very limited role for government. Government really exists for uh, protection and justice, defense, and there uh, is, it's she, there's just, uh, we don't have, as we do today, a government that redistributes well. Government is strictly limited. However, she didn't accept, and she explicitly rejected the view held by Murray Rothbard, that uh, defense and protection, justice, can be handled by the market as well. She was a, a minarchist, not an anarchist, and she thought that in each territory there should just be one protection agency. She didn't favor competing private protection agencies. Now, uh, this is, completes the overview that I want to give of Rand's philosophy. And what I want to do now, and we'll continue in the, the next lecture, is to go into more details about Rand's metaphysics and epistemology and look at how sound the arguments are that she advances for her views. Now, the fundamental principle of objectivist metaphysics is the law of identity. A is A. And connected uh, together with this, the law of non-contradiction, nothing can be both A and not A at the same time, in the same respect. Suppose I say, I'm looking at a table now. Well, the table is the table, and it can't be the case that this table is both a table and not a table. Now, that seemed perfectly straightforward, but in the way these principles are understood by most modern log logicians, they're taken in a purely formal sense. What I mean by that is that logicians would say, suppose you have some statement that has the form both A and not A, then you can reject that 
statement. It's a malformed statement. It violates law of non-contradiction. But laws of identity and non-contradiction don't tell you much by themselves. They just say they don't really tell you what the nature of the world is. They just say whatever the world is, it has to conform. It, it has to, these these laws are true. They're purely formal statements. Uh, but objectivists understand the uh, law of identity in a much more far-reaching way. And to understand their views, we have to introduce some philosophical distinctions, some distinctions that are very common in modern philosophy. And here, to get the objectivist point of view, the key essay to read is one by Leonard Peikoff called The Analytic Synthetic Dichotomy. If you're able to get a copy of Rand's book, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, in the second edition, it's readily available in paperback. I'm sorry I couldn't put it on, I didn't want to put it on the reading list because it's not available online, but you can find this inexpensively very easily. So this book has Peikoff's essay, and I think if possible, everyone should try to read this. It's a very important essay to get the objectivist view of metaphysics. So uh, philosophers often distinguish between two kinds of statements, analytic and synthetic. An analytic statement is one that's true just because of the concepts that it, of which it consists. And a synthetic statement is one that isn't true just because of the concepts of which it consists. It's one that you would know to be true or false just by testing, just from experience. Now, example will make this distinction clear. Let's consider the statement, all bachelors are unmarried. Well, I don't have to go out into the world and test this. I don't have to say, well, all bachelors so far have turned out to be unmarried, but maybe there's one I'll find that is married. It's a part of the definition of bachelor that a bachelor is unmarried, so I'm not going to find anyone that's married. There can't be married bachelors. It's ruled out by definition. But let's contrast that with the statement uh, bachelors tend not to live as long as married men. I don't know whether that's true, but if it is true, it would be something we could only find out by investigation. It isn't part of the meaning of the terms in that proposition that married men, I mean, that bachelors tend not to live as long as married men, that makes that statement true. There's nothing about bachelors that has anything to, implies anything about how long bachelors tend to live. But objectivists don't agree with this distinction. They think there isn't a separate kind of statement that's made true just from the meaning of the terms as, op as opposed to another kind of statement that's just learned to be true from experience. They hold that there aren't any analytic statements. There isn't a separate set of truths of meaning. Now, related to the analytic synthetic distinction is another distinction between a priori and a posteriori truths. Now, a priori truth is one that can be known just by thinking about it. And an a posteriori truth is one that has to be known through experience. Now, as you can see, this is this distinction between a priori and a posteriori is very closely related to the previous distinction between analytic and synthetic. And in fact, some philosophers line up 
these two distinctions exact, uh, exactly with each other. They'll say all and only analytic statements are a priori, and all and only synthetic statements are a posteriori. Uh, I take, again, all bachelors are unmarried is something I could find out to be true just by thinking about it, but bachelors tend to live not as long as married people is something I could only know to be true by in investigation. I couldn't know it just by thinking about it. So, again, uh, some philosophers line up these pair, this, the, these two pairs of distinction exactly the same way. There are philosophers who don't. Kant thought there's some propositions that are a priori you could know just by thinking about them, but are synthetic, or ones that are, 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 uh, give you knowledge of the world that isn't available just by because of the meaning of the terms in the statement. So Kant thought there were propositions that are not analytic, they're not true just because of the meaning of the terms, but nevertheless you could know to be true just by thinking about them. So that's a very controversial view. Now the objectivists, as you would expect, reject the a priori because they say all truths come from experience. All our concepts come from experience. So there aren't any a priori truths. Now, uh, philosophers often make a third distinction, and this is one between necessary and contingent truths. Now, a necessary truth is one that couldn't have been otherwise, whereas a contingent truth is one that could have been otherwise. And this distinction often, but not for all philosophers, lines up with the other two distinctions, that between analytic and synthetic and a priori, a posteriori. Let me give you an example. Suppose, let's go back to our now hackneyed example, all bachelors are unmarried. Well, this couldn't possibly be false. We couldn't find a situation in which we come across a married bachelor, as long as we keep the meaning of the term, the, call the meaning of the term concept. It isn't that they're in the actual world, the world we're living in, bachelors are unmarried, but maybe there's some weird science fiction world in which bachelors are married. It's just there's no possible situation, no possible world in which bachelors are married. So it's a necessary truth that bachelors are unmarried. But suppose we take the statement, uh, I'm now giving a lecture. Well, that seems contingent we could certainly imagine circumstances in which I'm not giving this lecture. Suppose I just had, uh, decided I don't want to give a lecture, so it's contingent. I wouldn't be giving one. It's contingent that I'm giving the lecture. Now, uh, you would probably expect, given the way I've explained how the, the objectivists reject the distinction between uh, analytic, synthetic, and also reject this, uh, a priori, a posteriori. They would also reject necessary propositions, this distinction between necessary and contingent, and they largely do, but the way that they do this is surprising. You would expect them to say there aren't any necessary propositions, and this, in fact, is exactly the path taken by the great 20th century philosophy, philosopher W. V. O. Quine, who rejected uh, analytic statements and also a priori statements, he also said there aren't any necessary statements. But the objectivists don't take this path. On the contrary, they hold that aside from human choices, everything else in the world is necessary. So everything that exists in the world 
necessarily exists with all its properties. So for objectivists, all of the properties of an entity are part of its essence. Uh, they're necessary properties. So suppose we find that light travels at approximately 186,000 miles per second. Then, in their view, it's part of the definition of light that it travel at that speed. There's no possible world in which light travels at a different speed. This is a defining characteristic of light. So, the objective view is that all of an object's properties hold of necessity. Now, an object's properties include its causal properties. Suppose we say the Earth has a causal property of being able to attract certain objects to it by gravitation. This is also an essential property. It's one that holds of necessity. So, all the properties of an object, including its causal properties, are necessary properties. Now, a further claim they make is that nothing can come into existence without a cause. Something can't just pop into existence. They take that to be a violation of the law of identity also. So, we can see this, if they hold these two doctrines that nothing can come into existence without a cause and all of an object's properties are necessary, then this has a consequence. Well, what about the ultimate constituents of the world? Suppose we say uh, certain things are caused by other things, and then we get to things that don't have a cause, but we just got to ultimate constituents of things, then what would we say about them? Well, since they they don't have a cause, they can't come into existence, so therefore they've existed eternally. The ultimate constituents of things have existed eternally. And further, it's that they have all their properties necessarily. So, in the objectivist view, there couldn't have been another set of ultimate constituents. So, in the next lecture, we'll continue going into more detail about Rand's metaphysics and epistemology. We'll try to go over some of the arguments and see how valid some of the arguments are that she advanced for her views.